In July of 1898, Marie Sklodowska Curie and her husband Pierre Curie published their discovery of a new substance they called polonium by declaring they had found une substance nouvelle radioactive. Yeah, I got bad grades in French class. Why do you ask? Which translates to a new radioactive substance. This is actually the origin of the term radioactive. So why did they make up this new term? Well, polonium was very radiation active, 400 times more powerful than uranium. And radio was very commonly used at this time for any radiation in the air. For example, wireless telegraphs were often called radiograms. Although some people used that term in the following years, the phrase radioactivity only gained popularity when Curie published her PhD thesis titled radioactive substances in 1903. But why would the world listen to a shy Polish immigrant who was gasp, a woman? To understand that, we need to study why she knew so much about radioactivity and how the world responded to her discoveries. Ready? Let's go! It all started when Henri Becquerel found to his frustration that the sun never really came out. It was cloudy in Paris between February 26 and March 1st of 1896. Why was this frustrating, you may ask? Well, Becquerel had this theory that when certain fluorescent salts absorbed sunlight, they produced x-rays. And how could he validate that without the sunlight? This wasn't a completely crazy idea. X-rays were newly discovered and no one really knew what they were, just that they were produced when something called a cathode ray hit a solid. Becquerel also felt that cathode rays were invisible light that made glass and fluorescence glow. Since cathode rays make x-rays and cathode rays made things glow, it seemed logical to see if there's a connection between things that glow like fluorescence and phosphorescence. Fluorescence only glow when they're hit with light. Phosphorescence glow even after the outside light is removed. And x-rays. Anyway, after a few weeks of playing with different glowing materials, Becquerel was happy to report that phosphorescent uranium salts that sat in sunlight would produce invisible rays that would go through paper and could be seen on film. After publishing, Becquerel produced some more uranium salts to do further experiments. But he was irritated when his sample was ready, but the sun was not. So he just threw his uranium in a drawer with his photographic plates. The next two days were also cloudy, and Becquerel realized that his uranium salts were no longer fluorescent or phosphorescent. Annoyed, he just decided to develop the film anyway as a baseline, quote, expecting to find the images very weak. Instead, to his complete surprise, quote, the silhouettes appeared with great intensity. By November, Becquerel found that uranium didn't even need to be fluorescent or phosphorescent. All uranium would produce these rays. And for this reason, he called the new rays uranium rays. And he also determined that these rays would make the air slightly conducted. However, there wasn't very much interest in these uranium rays. And even Becquerel got bored and moved on to other subjects. Fast forward 10 months till September of 1897. Marie Sklodowska Curie was 29 years old and had just given birth to a baby named Irene. Her husband Pierre had just finished getting his PhD with her help and it was now her turn. Marie Curie recalled, quote, it became a serious problem how to take care of our little Irene and our home without giving up my scientific work. Such a renunciation would have been very painful to me and my husband would not even think of it. Luckily, her father-in-law moved in to help with babysitting. While researching the latest papers, she bumped into Becquerel's papers about uranium rays and electricity and decided to study them more with an electric meter device. See, years earlier, Pierre Curie had discovered that electricity is related to pressure for certain materials called piezoelectricity. And he had used piezoelectric materials to make the world's most sensitive electricity meter. So it seemed like a good plan. After a bit of electrical study on uranium with different chemical properties, she determined that it seemed like these uranium rays were just a property of the uranium itself. It then seemed illogical to her that only one substance in the whole world would act like this. 
So Marie Sklodowska Curie then gathered all the substance that she could and exhaustively studied them in an electroscope looking for more radioactive substances. By April of 1898, she found that a substance called thorium was about as radioactive as uranium. Before she could publish, however, she found that a German scientist had already discovered that thorium was radioactive with photographic plates. However, the electric method allowed her to determine exactly how radioactive thorium was. She then published her first paper on radioactivity on April 12, 1898, where she mentioned how active the different materials were. Marie continued to search. While she was experimenting with a uranium ore, also called pitch blend, which was a mix of uranium with other materials. Murray Sklodowska Curie was astonished to realize that the ore was significantly more radioactive than pure uranium and realized it must contain trace amounts of a new material that was even more radioactive. Pierre was so intrigued he dropped his own research to join her in the laboratory. And for the next several years they worked side by side, sometimes even filling in different sides of the same notebook. By July of 1898, as I said in the introduction, they published their discovery of a new material polonium, named after Marie's home country of Poland. In this paper the Curies also named the radiation rays Becquerel rays in honor of Henri Becquerel, which it was called for many years. Becquerel was intrigued, and he even introduced the paper to the Parisian Academy. This paper also intrigued a German chemist named Frederick Giesel, who began doing his own experiments with uranium pitch blend, although, as he told the Curies a few years later, quote, even Röntgen, the man who discovered x-rays, did not believe in the existence of Becquerel rays at first. A few months after the discovery of polonium in December 1898, they discovered an even more radioactive substance in the uranium ore that they called radium, named after radiation as it was so strongly radioactive. With only a little bit of isolation, radium displayed some amazing properties. It was always hot, it would burn the skin without hurting, and it would glow continuously without any power source and without any change in size and shape. In addition, anything that touched the radium, including the Curies themselves, became radioactive. In Germany, Geisel realized that the new substance that he had discovered that glowed with a quote, most splendid light that he could read by was also radium. Now the race was on to isolate it. The Curies were sure they could do it in a couple of weeks. Instead, it took four years to get enough to measure its atomic weight, which was particularly daunting as they were working in a literal shed that was described by a visiting chemist as, quote, a cross between a stable and a potato cellar. In 1900, in Germany, Frederick Geisel had a friend named Walkoff, who was a dentist and interested in studying the effects of x-rays in dentistry. Geisel then loaned a coveted 0.2 gram piece of partially isolated radium to Walkoff, and Walkoff then published his studies of the effects of putting it on his skin for a couple of hours, noticing how the burn would last for many weeks. Pierre Curie then read about Walkoff's and Geisel's experiments and decided to one-up it and burn his skin for over 10 hours. And Pierre Curie used to make burning his own arm a regular part of his lectures. After testing on animals, Pierre Curie became convinced that radium could cure tumors and certain kinds of cancer. Although it was too expensive to be a regular part of medical care and instead was used as specialty medicine or as part of scams. As Pierre and Marie Curie's daughter Eva wrote many years later, radium was useful, magnificently useful, and the extraction of the new element no longer had merely experimental interest. It had become indispensable. A radium industry was about to be born. By April of 1902, Marie and Pierre Curie managed to get one-tenth of a gram of radium chloride salt that was more than a million times more radioactive than uranium, which the Curies refused to patent and gave away to universities for free. In fact, they went so far that in 1921, Marie Sklodowska Curie had to basically do a GoFundMe to get one gram of radium. Meanwhile, in Germany, Frederick Geisel had managed to isolate radium in a simpler method 
and put it on the market. According to Ernest Rutherford, Dr. Geisel put pure radium bromide on the market at one pound per milligram or a thousand pounds a gram. Even at these exorbitant prices, there was too much demand and Geisel upped the price by 12 times. Now, 12,000 pounds in 1903 was the equivalent in 1903 of about $60,000. To give you a sense of how expensive it was, the Hope Diamond sold in 1909 for $80,000. Geisel was wealthy, but the Curies were not. Even worse, their health was faltering. Geisel, by the way, was radioactive too. For example, in 1905, it was recorded that even his breath was radioactive for 18 full hours after he left the laboratory. However, despite being a walking biohazard, he lived until he was 75 and then died of lung cancer. Anyway, Pierre Curie was particularly ill and his doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. We now realize it was radiation poisoning. Both Pierre and Marie Curie were covered in burns. Then, in August of 1903, Marie Curie suffered a miscarriage. She wrote her sister, I am absolutely desperate and cannot be consoled. I had wanted the child so badly. Meanwhile, Marie Sklodowska Curie had to hold it together to publish her PhD thesis. She titled it Radioactive Substances and defended it on June of 1903, where the committee told her she had produced, quote, the greatest scientific contribution ever made in a doctoral thesis. Her thesis was translated into multiple languages and was considered the Bible of radioactive research. Marie, however, was still mourning the miscarriage and Pierre was pretty ill and they were both suffering from exhaustion from overwork and radiation poisoning. It was around this time that Pierre learned from a friend that he and Henri Becquerel were being nominated for a Nobel Prize without Marie Curie. Pierre had no interest, even with a sizable amount of money, to win an award without his wife for this amazing work. Luckily, a friend basically pulled some strings and they ended up splitting Pierre's part in two. So they both got a quarter of a Nobel Prize, making Marie Curie the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. By the way, there wasn't another winner of a Nobel Prize for physics or chemistry, not named Curie, for 60 years. I say the last name Curie as Marie Curie won another Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1911 and her daughter Irene Jolette Curie won one in 1935. The Curies were glad for the cash but hated the publicity. I mean, Pierre Curie called it his stupid life, but the public was fascinated with Marie Curie. A tiny female scientist, a romance, a mysterious substance that glowed and could cure diseases. It was all too fascinating. And everywhere it was said that Marie Sklodowska Curie discovered radium and radioactivity. And we have used the term radioactive and dropped the term Becquerel rays ever since. So that's how radioactive and radioactivity got its name. Now, in Marie Sklodowska Curie's thesis, as I have explained, she did not come up with the term radioactive as she came up with that term five years earlier. But it was her thesis and her popularity and radium's popularity that made that term so commonplace. However, she did come up with a new term in her 1903 thesis. Curie came up with the term gamma rays for the third type of radiation from a radioactive material. Why she did that and why she's not given credit for it, and it's not sexism, is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks to my patrons who support me. If you want to join their ranks, there's a link down below. Give me a thumbs up, share it on social media. You know what to do. You just have to do it. Anyway. Thank you so much for watching my video. Have a good day and stay safe. <laughs> That's my witchy powers. Do it.